Hello, and welcome to this APGO basic science objective video about ovarian neoplasms. The objectives of this video are to understand the different cell types involved in ovarian neoplasms, review the biochemical markers in identifying ovarian neoplasms, and review genetic predispositions to ovarian neoplasm, briefly BRCA and Lynch syndrome. Well, that was a really rich clinic. Do you have any questions? Just a quick question. How is it that something as small as an ovary can have tumors that present in so many ways? I thought it was homogenous, but today we saw five different types of ovarian neoplasms. All of them seem to have different cells of origins and properties. How is that possible? Well, your first assumption that the ovary is homogenous is the real mistake. As you know, the ovary is about 3 by 2 centimeters in size in a premenopausal patient. It is suspended between the ovarian ligament medially and the infundibulopelvic ligament laterally and superiorly. The outer cortex contains the ova and follicles, while the inner medulla houses the blood vessels and connective tissue. There are three major cell types, each which give rise to multiple tumor types. The three main types include epithelial tumors derived from stem cells that would give rise to the fallopian tube and ovarian surface epithelium. Next are the germ cell tumors, which are derived from the primordial germ cells of the ovary. Finally, sex cord stromal tumors are derived from stem cells that would otherwise create the ovarian stroma or follicles. Let's take each of these cell types in turn and discuss a little about the different tumors that they can create. First, epithelial carcinoma is the most frequent type of ovarian cancer and accounts for almost 90% of ovarian malignancies. Benign epithelial tumors include serous cystadenoma, mucinous cystadenoma, or endometroid. There are also several malignant epithelial tumors. These include high-grade serous endometroid carcinoma, clear cell carcinoma, mucinous carcinoma, and low-grade serous carcinoma. High-grade serous carcinoma accounts for 70 to 80% of epithelial carcinomas. The key pathologic feature is marked cytologic atypia with prominent mitotic activity. Many patients have TP53 or BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Endometroid carcinoma accounts for about 10% of epithelial carcinomas. These tumors usually present in women between 40 and 50 years old. Fortunately, it is often diagnosed at an earlier state and is chemosensitive, or susceptibility of tumor cells to cell-killing effects of anti-cancer drugs. About 15 to 20% of patients can have concurrent uterine cancer, and it may be hard to identify the primary. This type is most commonly associated with Lynch syndrome, and autosomal dominant hereditary colon cancer, often associated with cancer of the endometrium, ovary, gastrointestinal tract, upper urinary tract, brain, and skin. Clear cell carcinoma comprises about 10% of epithelial carcinomas in this group. It is usually identified early, however, late stage tumors are not sensitive to chemotherapy. There is a reduction of clear cell tumors for women who have undergone a tubal ligation and it may be due to limited retrograde menstruation. It is thought that clear cell carcinoma arises from endometriosis. Mucinous carcinoma also comprises 10% of epithelial carcinomas. It nearly always presents at stage 1 and usually in premenopausal women. It can be very big, as much as 20 centimeters in diameter, and usually unilateral. About 3% of epithelial carcinomas are low-grade serous carcinomas. This is a slow-growing tumor and is resistant to platinum-based therapy. A key feature is the hyaluronic stroma with numerous somoma bodies. Oh, wow. Okay, now I get it. There is such variety in ovarian tissue that it leads to so many tumor possibilities. Do we know what promotes growth in this tumor type? Growth factor signaling promotes epithelial tumor cell growth. There are three main growth factors that are involved. Fibroblast growth factor binds to FGF receptors and helps drive tumor cell growth in angiogenesis. High levels of serum FGF in cancer patients correlate to advanced disease progression and decreased survival. Platelet-derived growth factor binds to PDGF receptors expressed in parasites and vascular smooth muscle cells. Binding promotes angiogenesis by stabilizing new blood vessels. Finally, vascular endothelial growth factor binds to VEGF receptors, which are the central mediators of angiogenesis. They promote proliferation, migration, and survival of vascular endothelial cells. 
VEGF expression can be induced by other growth factors and high serum VEGF levels is associated with decreased survival and poor prognosis. So we still have two more tumor cell types to go. Are you sure you have time? Oh yes, what's next? The next big category of tumor types includes germ cell tumors. They account for 20 to 25% of all ovarian neoplasms, but only 5% of malignant tumors. They usually occur in young women between 10 to 30 years old. Germ cell tumors can either be benign, such as a mature teratoma, or malignant. Dermoid tumors or mature teratomas account for about 95% of germ cell tumors. The tumor has components of all three somatic cell types, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Characteristically, the gross specimen will contain hair, teeth, and fat. A solid prominence, Rokitansky protuberance, is at the junction between normal ovarian tissue and teratoma. This prominence has the most cellular variety and needs to be carefully evaluated for any malignant potential. The most common malignant germ cell tumors are immature teratomas. Other malignant tumors include dysgerminomas, yolk sac tumors, and mixed germ cell tumors. Malignant or immature teratomas comprise about 2% of germ cell tumors. The ectodermic component usually undergoes malignant transformation to include neural tissue. Perineoplastic syndromes such as N-methyl-D aspartate, receptor encephalitis, can be seen with both mature and immature teratomas, in which the immune system attacks this protein in the brain. There are several rare malignant germ cell tumors. This includes dysgerminomas, which are the female counterparts to the male seminomas. This is a rapidly growing tumor often seen in young women. Yolk sac tumors account for about one-third of the tumors in premenarchal girls. Schiller-Duval bodies can be seen in this tumor type. Finally, there are mixed germ cell tumors and the very rare pure embryonal carcinomas, non-gestational choriocarcinomas, and pure polyembryomas. Fortunately, many of the germ cell tumors can be identified with hormonal or enzymatic activity. HCG can be found elevated in embryonal cell carcinomas, ovarian choriocarcinomas, mixed germ cell, and some dysgerminomas. AFP is elevated in yolk sac tumors, embryonocell carcinomas, polyembryoma carcinomas, and mixed germ cells. Finally, LDH is elevated in dysgerminomas. Being aware of these can help when trying to identify if a cyst on a patient may be benign or malignant. Sex cord stroma tumors are from cells that would normally give rise to structures surrounding the oocyte. Malignant sex cord stroma tumors are rare and account for only 1.2% of all primary ovarian cancers. There are four different types of sex cord stroma tumors, granulosa cell tumors, sertoliolytic cells, thecomas, and fibromas. Granulosa cell tumors are the most likely to have malignant potential of all the sex cord stroma tumors. Usually, they are very large and unilateral. The tumors commonly secrete large quantities of estrogen. Therefore, all these patients should have endometrial sampling to rule out uterine hyperplasia. Many granulosa cell tumors also release inhibin A and B, and this can be used as a biomarker for this tumor. Cal Exner bodies are also commonly seen on pathology. Sertoliolytic cell tumors are less likely to be malignant with less than 20% undergoing malignant transformation. These tumors often produce large quantities of androgens or androgen precursors. The comas are solid, generally benign tumors. They can become very large, which will often raise significant alarm. They have been known in 15 to 25% of cases to stimulate uterine and endometrial pathology, so patients need to be broadly assessed. Fibromas are the most common sex cord stroma tumor. They are benign solid neoplasm usually found in postmenopausal women. Fibromas can be associated with Meig syndrome, which is a triad of fibromas, ascites, and pleural effusion. This is probably due to vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, that increases capillary permeability. This is an amazing array of tumor types for one small organ, but when you see a patient with an ovarian mass, how do you even know what it is, and if you should expectantly manage or operate? That is the most important issue. Ovarian cancer is the most common cause of gynecologic cancer death in the United States. 
However, most cancers are identified in the late stage and often many benign tumors are removed to identify a few early stage tumors. There are a few biomarkers available to help triage at nexal masses. However, no marker is sensitive nor specific for even the most common carcinomas. CA125 is a large transmembrane glycoprotein derived from both salomic and mullerian epithelia. It can be evaluated in 50% of women with early epithelial cancer and 80% with late stage. Unfortunately, CA125 can also be evaluated in several other conditions that cause peritoneal inflammation, which limits its specificity for ovarian cancer. Let's pause, think, and apply. What are some other conditions that would also elevate CA125 levels? Other conditions include endometriosis, uterine fibroids, cirrhosis with and without ascites, PID, cancer of the endometrium, breast, lung, and pancreas, pleural or peritoneal fluid. HE4 is derived from human epididymis protein and is a product of the WFDC gene, which is overexpressed in patients with serous and endometrioid cancer. HE4 is a marker that is useful for monitoring recurrent or progressive disease in epithelial ovarian cancer and can be used to help with evaluations as part of the risk malignancy algorithm. Aroma or the risk of malignancy algorithm includes CA125 and HE4. This algorithm is useful for assessing a woman's risk if she has a mass and is undergoing surgery. The menopausal status is used to help stratify patients into low and high risk groups. OVA panel or a multivariant index assay includes five biomarkers and was approved by the FDA in 2009. The markers include CA125, beta-2 microglobulin, transferrin, transthyretin, and apolipoprotein A1. Scores are combined to give a risk index score. Similar to aroma, menopausal status is used to create a high and low probability of disease categories. As you can imagine, with such heterogeneous group of diseases, it is also very hard to talk about familial risk for ovarian cancer. Most ovarian cancer is due to a sporadic mutation. However, if there is familial risk, it is usually due to BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. Ovarian cancer can also be a part of a familial cancer syndrome. The most common include Putz-Jeger syndrome and Lynch syndrome. BRCA1 gene is located on chromosome 17 at the Q21 loci, while BRCA2 gene is located on chromosome 13. Both genes are important in a large framework of repair molecules. Patients with a BRCA1 mutation have an average cumulative risk for developing ovarian cancer of about 39%, while BRCA2 patients' risk is around 11%. The average age for developing ovarian cancer in this population is also lower than the general population with the average age in BRCA1 at 40 years old and BRCA2 at 50 years old. Let's pause, think, and apply. Your patient had genetic testing for ovarian cancer after her mother died of the disease at a young age. She is BRCA1 positive. What can she do to reduce her risk of getting ovarian cancer? For ovarian cancer, there is little in the way of screening although some would recommend CA125 levels and pelvic ultrasound starting at age 30 to 35. Chemoprophylaxis is commonly combined with hormonal contraception. Risk-reducing bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy can be considered after childbearing or between 35 to 40 years of age. There is some data that removing the fallopian tubes alone can reduce the risk of ovarian cancer as many ovarian cancers probably originate in the fallopian tube. Putz-Jeger syndrome is a mutation in SKT11. 95% of patients will have mucocutaneous pigmented lesions and usually a non-epithelial ovarian cancer in about 21% of patients. Cancers are usually diagnosed at a mean age of 27. They also show an increased risk of GI and breast cancer. Lynch syndrome is caused by a mutation in the mismatch repair of the MMR genes and mutation in epithelial cell adhesion molecule EPCAN gene. It is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. Lynch syndrome is associated with an increased risk of colon, endometrial, ovarian, and stomach cancer.
a number of moderately increased gene mutations are also associated with ovarian cancer. About 3 to 5% of patients that come in for testing for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer will have a mutation in one of these moderately increased risk genes. But at this time, we are not sure how to use this information to guide patients and their families. Thanks for your time today, Dr. Knows a lot, and for really helping me understand the vast neoplastic potential of what I thought was a small blob of tissue, the ovary. I am definitely more prepared to see my patients tomorrow. This concludes this APGO basic science objective video about ovarian neoplasms. You should be able to understand the different cell types involved in ovarian neoplasms, review the biochemical markers in identifying ovarian neoplasms, CA125, and larger sequence used, and review genetic predispositions to ovarian neoplasm, briefly BRCA and Lynch syndrome. Thanks for watching!